Um, you're, oh, are you, you're, you're chiming in from England. Oh, excellent. Um, so, uh, uh, I just want to make a quick note, uh, to everyone, um, that, uh, this, uh, that this talk is being recorded. So, um, I, I just need to make that known because we're going to be publishing it online, uh, later. So anyways, my name is Dustin O'Hara. I'm the director of the Internet Studies Center uh, here at Western Washington University. Um, the, uh, the ISC aims to foster an interdisciplinary approach to the study and design of digital technologies. And the lecture series presents leading scholars and practitioners whose work challenges and extends our understanding of digital technology and its place in the world. Uh, SJ builds frameworks to uh, improve how autonomous systems, algorithms, and humans communicate uh, or human communities uh, work together. Uh, uh, she's the founder of uh, Bodicea Light Industries, uh, uh, where uh, she, uh, she creates processes and technologies to support community led disinformation defense. She's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, chairs the COGSEC Collab. Uh, formerly Miss Infosec, and uh, leads the CTI uh, uh, League um, disinformation team, among many other um, impressive uh, activities and accomplishments. Um, her background includes uh, intelligent systems, crowdsourced data gathering, autonomous systems, and how they relate to humans, data strategy, uh, policy and ethics with uh, with uh, when it's especially with how it's applied to nation state development and crises. So, so with that, um, I'd like to give a warm welcome to SJ. Thank you for for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, is this where I get started? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to do the usual dance of completely failing to get sales slides to work. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> Right. Um, the usual stance of forgetting to share the screen. Sorry. Ah, host disabled participant sh screen sharing. You should be able to share your screen now. Okay, you should see a um window with a slide in it yeah it, it looks great cool great it's working then mm -hmm. so thank you for the intro i'm sj uh what i really care about is the effects of computers uh technologies and especially algorithms on humans and their communities and i tend to go looking for trouble um the latest trouble that I saw early and decided to start working on was disinformation. Um, so about 10 years ago, we started seeing this in some of the other work I was working on. Uh, five years ago, I decided to work part time and dedicate the rest of the time to building up defenses against what looked like a threat at the time. Um, at the time, I was working with a lot of journalists who were calling it fake news and worrying about it being a pollution in their um, news feeds. And I looked at it and went, hang on, this looks really, really like an information security attack. So basically a hack attack, but instead of using machines and the connections between them, it was humans, human communities and connections between them. So there was a, an equivalence. So a lot of the work I'm talking about today is about that equivalence. So let's let's go heading into it. Uh, Cogsec Colab and the CTI League's disinformation team are both response teams. They track disinformation, but they also respond to it. So we work through some things we did, some of the underpinning framework work we've done to make that work. So looking at last year, uh, because talking about this year is it's not done yet. <laughs> it's, um, so last year, an awful lot of things changed uh, in the disinformation ecosystem. Uh, it became a lot more visible. Um, the 
types of incidents we were seeing changed. It came at speed. Everybody was stuck at home. COVID was coming through and it basically at the same time as the COVID epidemic, there was an equivalent infodemic of misinformation around COVID, around response, around who was doing what. And the CTI League team was set up to track that infodemic. So definitions, what are we talking about? Uh, and guys, uh, we're a fairly small group, so at any point stop me and say, hey, can we look at that or um, please say say about. But basically, when we started, we started talking about disinformation, everyone else was using the word misinformation. Um, there's a difference. Misinformation is false content. So it's that idea of fake news, that idea of facts that are wrong, um, that idea of things including deep fake, so faked um, content, faked information. Disinformation, the content doesn't have to be fake. There's falsehood, but the falsehood is sometimes quite often in other places within the system. So disinformation is the use of false information, but it's also the use of misleading information. It's the use of misattribution. So for instance, a real photograph, but a false um, labeling of it or a false use of it. So it might be the right place, but the photograph is years old. It might be something like the sharks on the subway. Every natural disaster, there are there's a, an image somewhere of sharks swimming up the street or sharks in the subway. It, it, it's just some of these things are perennial. Um, disinformation, it could be the presentation of the person that's um, false. So the idea of botnets and trolls, um, the you know, Russians hiding behind accounts pretending to be Midwestern mid mid Western housewives. It, it could be folk, fake groups. So we've seen a lot of this, especially in healthcare disinformation. Um, but before that, there were fake groups um, set up um, around elections, uh, specifically uh, groups uh, for people of color. Um, a lot of these groups were created to pull in real people and exacerbate divisions. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about in a little while is, is narratives and the stories you tell yourself about who you are, who you belong to. And in groups, out groups. Um, so dividing up groups weakens a country. So those have been useful to them. Um, but it's this idea of there is a falsehood. There's also an intent, uh, an intent to harm using those falsehoods. And the thing that we've looked at, the definitions we've used is this one on the left, is we look at online mostly, although we include in our models offline disinformation. Um, and we're looking at it creating, we're looking at it propagating, we're looking at it being used. So it's down the whole chain of use. And the other thing we look at is effect. So intended effect. So most disinformation is trying to change beliefs or trying to change emotions. And it's usually aimed at doing that in large numbers of people, either large numbers of people or even influential people. So you can change uh, actions in the real world. So it could be as simple as policy actions, or it may just be creating absolute bloody confusion. Um, that also we've seen a lot in, in the last few months, just this idea of making it incredibly difficult to govern a community of people. So misinformation, again, looking at, looking at COVID, looking at the health narratives, and we saw a lot of fake narratives last year. So this is, this is at the narrative level. Um, I'm going to be talking about levels, but um, basically a message or user account or the links between accounts, um, th those are artifacts. Those are things that we find. Narratives is the next layer up. It's the, the story, story level. So these are at the story level and we found hundreds of different stories. 
um, with millions of artifacts underneath them. So everything from where did this come from to it doesn't exist, um, lots and lots of medical scams. A lot of there was a lot of money going on here. So people trying to get um, people to send over money for various cures. Um, the start there were lots of cure myths. Um, know which countries had cures already. Uh, the really interesting thing was these crossovers. So what we saw last year was a lot of very different misinformation fields. Um, so for instance, 5G, there's been a huge body of misinformation around the 5G rollouts. Um, you know, these things give you cancer, they're, they're trying to depopulate, but they got mixed in with the COVID narratives. Um, we saw the anti-fax narrative being mixed in with the Second Amendment narratives. Uh, we, we saw the black helicopters, you know, there were he helicopters spraying the COVID myths in several countries. So you've got these crossovers going on, um, which created much larger communities, much larger, larger target markets for the, the people creating disinfo. Uh, we got these crossovers with the freedom rights. We, we saw a lot of anti-stay at home uh, communities building. Um, the usual far right, um, which everyone is very aware of now, <laughs> were part of this, but they were mixing up with anti-vax moms. So it, it's, it's been interesting. Um, and in the middle of all this, so you've got um, a lot of internal stuff to the US, you've got a lot of people trying to profit, but you also have the geopolitics of countries trying to influence each other's populations. Um, so Russia is the one everyone thinks of. Uh, China moved from most of its misinformation or disinformation work was basically a charm campaign, trying to get people to think better things about China to the now aggressive. They, they're now making very Russia-like moves. Iran has been there for a long time. Um, blue check. The, the blue check has in the marks on things like Twitter, so verified accounts. So you, we saw a lot of disinformation coming from people who would otherwise be leaders. Um, one of whom I think just got um, the naughty card again. So in fact, yeah, they, I gotta say the word Trump. Um, so I think at one point about 38% of this disinformation was coming straight through Trump. So you've got this mix of different sources, a mix of different narratives a mix of different transports and intent. Why are they doing this? So geopolitics, countries, um, the, the usual gain of, of strengthening themselves, weakening others, um, trying to gain territories of different types. Um, there, there were Ukraine has always been a, a bit of a battleground for this. Um, internally within countries, groups trying to gain power. So we've seen this with the right-wing extremists who are building out power bases. Um, money, lots of people making money. Uh, attention seeking, still happening. Um, so you still get the sharks on the subway equivalents. You still got a lot of satire out there. Um, not so much. Um, generally, fairly limited and not these advanced persistent inflation campaigns. Um, and then the whole um, online discussions, so conspiracy theories uh, being part of this. So they, they got mixed in as well. So conspiracy, Nazis, protests all together. Uh, the money side. So the CTI League um, between the disinformation team and the Darkwake team tracked a lot, lot of hucksters. Um, we, we were tracking online sales um, from you know, blood t-shirts, lots of t-shirts connected to almost everything. Um, you name a conspiracy, there are a bunch of t-shirts. I, I have a long running beef that Amazon is still selling QAnon t-shirts. And views and clicks. So this is traditional way of making money. This is the Macedonian team method where you put up a website, uh, you put clickbait to it, and every time somebody looks at that site, you, you gain advertising money, money from advertising on that site. Um, clicks are rarer, so they're worth more money. So if you can get people to click or act in some way on your site, that's that's worth much, much more. 
but yeah, lo lots of cures, lots of lots of sites. And we spent a lot of time following money. And one of the things that if you're going to try to make money off people online, generally you need some form of endpoint. Um, you need either a site that you can control and put advertising on. This is natural news. This is, this is one of the original health misinformation sites. Um, so this has been around for a while, but last year it shifted. It moved from just health to other parts of misinformation. So for instance, the antifara and buses story, we, we tracked a lot of that back to a natural news story. So you have these sites, um, they're selling advertising. So one thing you can do to, to start countering, and part of this is talking about how you counter, is to start removing that money. So um, recently, we've been looking at things like um, payment processors uh, won't work with some of the misinformation sites if they know about them. So it's, it's like, tell people. Um, the big one, the online advertising. Um, so part of my background is as the data scientist setting up one of the early um, sites that monitored the websites that carried misinformation and monitored the traffic of um, advertising money going through them to start working with the advertising agencies to, to sh sh shut down that flow. Uh, not necessarily to get them blacklisted, but at least get them downlisted uh, to make it less profitable to, to add this. One of the problems with misinformation is that, or certainly that last year, was that you didn't get just one actor in this. You quite often get an actor that started and then a bunch of others jumped on for profit or gain or so taking some of that ecosystem out helps. Um, some of the things we tracked so some of the evolutions we looked at uh this one was was pretty typical uh this is one of the earlier uh anti-lockdown protests so it started uh to the left uh, and this is some of our image artifacts on one of our reports with um very small very localized instant very folksy handmade thing and that gets picked up and you start seeing these much um, better production values. You see it spreading out a lot further. And then to the right, you end up with, um, you know, a, a, now it becomes part of the um, freedom rights movements. So you're moving from people talking about a health crisis to people talking about Second Amendment and freedoms. And this, this was interesting also because this was a seed instance. So we saw instance being put up, tried out, and then spread across the whole country. So we would quite often see a, a group, a single group in one single place. And then suddenly there were groups across all of the states, um, down to individual um, towns, cities. So evolutions, um, th this is, I guess it's a form of astroturfing and that you're trying to, to build out that entire space, entire network. Um, this, is, this is another method that's been tried before. So uh, if you look uh, in Colombia, you'll see pink slime as a, a, a method. So there was a group of uh, local news sites. I think there's actually one for Bellingham. I, I managed to fall over and they a large network. I mean, I tracked 400 and something of them um, of sites that pre pretend to be local news, uh, pull in information from outside, um, reference each other. But it's a mixture of generated plus um, there were human slanted uh, reports in them. So AstroTurf on a big scale. Uh, another evolution, these face mask exemption cards. So you start again with this very folksy thing. Um, and, and when we worked on our first models, we added uh, go physical to our models because we thought that misinformation would move out into the real world. We just weren't expecting a whole year of it. Um, so again, you, you get this to the left, you get this sort of hippo is spelt wrong. 
it, it's you know you wouldn't take this seriously and then you get the freedom to breathe agency picks up the idea builds a site builds these high production value cars again this is somebody who uh influences who make money from their influence and this gets everywhere um to the right is it moving into canada so it's now it, it's gone from folksy to production value um now you're moving across to another country and at this point it doesn't just move country it also moves target so the one to the left is about freedom rights it, it's like trying to look official to the one to the right you're, you're seeing uh hugs over masks and the mothers against so this is very much targeted at um parents and the what you think of the children argument that canada bless them basically put out a message saying just cut these up if you see them america it's been a bit more of a problem uh, and even in england uh, they're still being used so these things they get around um countermeasures the good thing from last year was people started to use countermeasures to these uh Back in 2018, we ran an exercise um, to collect together countermeasures to the tactics techniques we found. And this was when we started seeing these really starting to happen. So the one to the top, um, Dave, if you're on this, thank you so much for these cards. Uh, it's basically a bunch of geeks and cards means you, you produce counter cards. So it's basically like large scale snap. Um, so the mask exemption override card was put up as a, okay, you can't be serious, um, response to the high production cards, the FTBA cards. Um, the one underneath that, uh, is the reality team. So this is interesting because most of the fight tends to be at the narrative level. Uh, you're not arguing out about over artifacts. You're arguing over those narratives, those beliefs behind those narratives. So we incubated the reality team, which is a group that builds um, counter narratives in real time and builds these really simple explainers. It's like, um, what is this thing? What is it really? And then link back to more information. So, and, and to the right, you've, you've got these um, mask information cards. None of this, it, it helps some, but in an environment where the disinformation is coming from every single direction and you don't have recognized sources of trust, it's, it's, it's band-aids really, um, which has got us into a fair bit of trouble together. Um, another part of the evolution, starting to see it in business more. So, Part of what I'm doing now, have been doing now, has been working on dis disinformation risk response for businesses. So how do you understand your risk relative to disinformation, not just as a target, but also as a company that might be drawn into a disinformation campaign? Um, for instance, Bill Gates um, has become a target of the 5G conspiracies. He's now become a target of COVID conspiracies. But there, there have been instances of businesses using this against each other, that disinformation itself is also a business. So there are disinformation factories out there, um, generally developing world um, groups, sometimes marketing agencies, sometimes moving over from spam. But th this, it's worth money. Running disinformation campaigns for other people is worth money. So looking at this, looking at how this might uh, continue through. So what do we do about it? And one of the things we've been doing for the past couple of years is, is running instant responses. And running those instant responses uh, from a security point of view. And I don't know if there are any InfoSec people in the room, but um, one thing that we've socialized heavily is this idea that there isn't just cybersecurity. Um, if you go to Black Hat, DEF CON, um, up to a year or so ago, 
most of the talks were talking about um, networks and wires and connections between them. There was some social engineering, but that was basically to get at the networks and wires and connections between them. And there was physical security recognized as a domain as well. This idea that um, why go through the wires where you can break in and take the computer. Um, but we've added this layer of cognitive security that you have these interactions where why try to extract information uh, to change actions when you can do this straight for the humans. So um, one thing that we also recognized is these things are enormous. So if you look at disinformation campaigns, the ones that I, I've mentioned so far, that was a lot of actors, a lot of information going past and a lot of specializations needed. So we basically need to connect up um, heterogeneous teams, lots of different disciplines. We need to get them to collaborate. We need to get them to talk together, um, talk similar language. For instance, uh, when we first started, the, the word campaign meant completely different things to the advertising people, to the military people, and to the infosec people that we had in the room. So consistency, it's hard. And this isn't something, you know, this isn't new to us. So 10 years ago, I was running large distributed teams responding to disasters. So building out um, situation pictures of what was happening in the disaster zone using social media plus all the data we could get our hands on. And this is a very similar problem. Um, you've got large data feeds, you're trying to build a situation picture of what's happening. And you're basing it off social media. There's a lot more disinformation going on. So there's a lot more deception, but there was, there was always deception in disasters too. Um, it doesn't take long for rumors to start flooding everywhere. So we started building these teams and we built out the misinfosec teams, the misinformation past security teams to, to start building. So misinfosec WG built standards, misinfosec was the group that we had combined starting to work on activation. We start of 20, 2020, um, we built out two teams. So uh, TEDx community built COVID-19 activation. And we built um, with part of the Atlantic Council COVID-19 disinformation, tracking COVID related disinformation. We then, <coughs> we'd also built out COGSEC CoLab as a community to build the toolings and processes and the ability for all of these teams to, to work and to communicate. And we were asked so the CTI League was set up last year to respond to information security incidents around COVID-19. So the attacks on hospitals, the attacks on hospital systems and all parts of the chain around COVID. And they realized they had a disinformation problem uh, as part of that and called us in, which is how we ran that piece. Threat is little company that I have set up, which is the thing you'll see at the end. Um, so three of us have started, actually four, which is part of the joke, um, a consulting company, company to, to work on this. But there are these different teams and they need ways to communicate, they need ways to work, um, they need process, need consistency. So CTI leak, this was about the dual thing of as cyber attacks happened, responding to them, but also working on stopping them happening in the first place and prevention. So community online response. And one of the things that each of those teams needed uh, was the system set. So the people process culture technology. So as with any online tracking, um, you need quite a lot of people because otherwise you are going to burn out badly. Uh, several of us did anyway you need to be able to connect out. It's, it's not enough to know what's going on. You need to be able to actually create action in the world. So you need to connect. Um, mental health, operational security, desperately important. Uh, this is difficult material and some of the actors are not pleasant. 
So being able to protect yourself in terms of your personal uh, machine and physical security, but also being able to protect yourself from the effects of looking at difficult material all the time. Um, have to build those in if you do this. Processes, uh, you need your team to understand both disinformation, but also how to respond to build threat response. Uh, and you need it fast because you'll need to do this quickly, repeatedly. Uh, and technology, technology is whatever works. Um, so speed and sharing uh, are the two big things. So you, you need to be able to do things quickly. You need to be able to share what you've done. So looking at it another way is looking at the types of activities that the Cyber Threat Intelligence team did, uh, the CTI League. So we were summarizing sharing information about incidents. So we were sharing out to people who could respond uh, rather than directly responding ourselves. Um, we also, because we were connected to so many technology com companies, we were in a position to ask for things like takedowns. Uh, so we could triage what's coming in, escalate that out to not necessary conventional actors. Um, you want to prevent this happening in the first place. So this is part of the CTI League team work. So what are the vulnerabilities that groups have? What are the vulnerabilities that specific um, hospitals or areas or players in vaccination have? And we worked on things like red teaming to get ahead of the narratives and the groups that we expected to come through. And also supporting uh, as part of that, supporting those those health or health groups. The the last thing is something that's also needed if you're going to build these teams. Uh, you need a way to collect and share information. So for us, it was sharing out, but also sharing out to the people building those counter narratives. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way um, that we worked was the response teams with the blue team. So cybersecurity, the blue team are the guys who are responding to, responding to incidents. The red team are the guys who are the people, sorry, not guys, um, the people who are acting as though they were uh, the aggressors. So you run red teams to learn about what um, the people on the other side are limited by, what they, they're capable of, what they might do next. Uh, and we found those extremely useful. So there, there's some of the examples of things we did. Um, looking at you know existing narratives, extending them out. We, we were a little surprised that temperature sensors didn't turn up as one of the big bads, but I, I guess, yeah, it, there, was, there was some work, but not much. Um, so another way of looking at this, if you start sizing this up, so a lot of things that we, we ran and did with the teams also had um, another correlation with information security in that in information security, you have security operation centers. Uh, and this is the people process technology uh, that you use to prevent and respond to security incidents. So we started looking at what the equivalence is to what we'd done and what we built to these socks uh, were. And one of the things was looking at what a sock actually does. And we broke it down to these three pieces. Um, the enablement work, the foundation work that you have to do. Uh, so the engineering work, the framework work, the training work you have to do before you can actually do the operations. Uh, if you're doing it at scale, you really have to do enablement. You can't just like dive in and um, go looking for some disinformation, pull some threats. Uh, that, that's fun. But if you want to do this sustainably over a long period of time, you have to build that, that foundation. Operations, this is the the day to day, the so threat intelligence research. So it's find things, investigate them, respond to them as, as appropriate. And then there's the third part, which is the testing validation. This is try to secure your system more. So do the things that you need to do to understand both the attack surfaces, but also your own vulnerabilities and the things that you can do to make it better. Um, and there's also compliance in there. I mean, it, it hasn't happened yet, but it will. Um, you know, pretty much every field I've, I've been part of, as it emerged, at some point regulations come and you have to meet those regulations. So keeping an eye on those. 
but also doing those testings of the system um, before somebody else gets in and breaks, breaks it. Um, part of that is we built out a lot of process. Uh, we've built out tools to, to work with. We built out training. Um, I had a course at WWU on how to respond to disinformation. I, I'm sorry, but this kind of got in the way of doing it. Um, but we, we use the course materials as part of our training packs for, for the, the group. So it kind of worked out. And we, built, we wrote a book, we're, we're finishing it. Um, so there's a team manual on how to do this. Again, repeatable process. So frameworks. I've talked a lot about what disinformation is. I've talked a lot about the people side of things, about the environments you need to set up to respond. And I'm going to dive into a lot of the fundamental work we did to make this actually work. So layer models. Um, I've talked about narratives and artifacts. So when we started, uh, people were responding to disinformation. And there wasn't really a language for all the pieces involved. Um, so we built this. And the idea of this is what you're looking at is all the pieces that uh, somebody attacking, somebody building a disinformation campaign puts together. Um, so from the top, quite often you get long running campaigns. Um, so these generally are nation state things, the advanced persistent threats. Um, so it could be uh, destabilized French politics. It could be um, gain part of the Ukraine. Um, it could also be a long running network of health misinformation sites create, you know, producing money. But you have these longer running things. Underneath that, you tend to get these shorter time limited incidents. And all the tracking we've done has been at the instant level. Um, so the thing happens, you respond to it. And generally, these are based around a specific topic or a specific event, but they're, they're, they're up, they're down. Um, the thing that they're based on is the narratives. So narratives are the stories you tell yourself. Um, so a story is transmission, a narrative. So something like an identity narrative is stories you tell yourself about who you are. Uh, In-group and out-group narratives, so the stories you tell yourself about the groups that you belong to and don't belong to. Uh, and then there were the world narratives about what's happening out there. E each of those is an attack surface. Each of those can be used. But below narratives are artifacts. So these are the messages, the images, the accounts, the, the groups and the relationships between them. And, and there's an awful lot of these. It's, it's a lot easier to track an instant at the narrative level and then pull out the artifacts that are of specific interest. So when we report, we tend to report um, from the top down to the bottom. So campaigns, incidents, narratives, artifacts. As a defender, you generally see the artifacts and you have to work out what the narratives are uh, and then work your way back up towards campaigns. Sometimes you're lucky. Um, you've kept enough knowledge or you've got enough intelligence, you know what the campaigns, the instants are coming through. Usually you've got yourself a list of narratives, um, but most of the time you're working back up with some of the, the artifacts. So modeling, so campaign, instant, narrative, artifact. This, this thing is a sticks diagram. So we adapted a whole bunch of information security tools and processes because we didn't have time. Frankly, we saw what was coming, um, the things that had just happened, and we didn't have time to mess around building a completely new set of processes, tools. We just looked for something that was mature enough that we could just pick up and, and, and use. And there are a set of tools called Sticks and Attack built by MITRE. And there are all sorts of um, so set of frameworks, but by MITRE, and there's all sorts of tools that work with them. So pretty much any existing SOC is probably using attack, generally using sticks. So we can, with a couple of small modifications, send messages to them in their formats that are about misinformation. So it adds that cognitive layer in. So this thing here. Uh, at the top, the campaign level, 
you've got the threat actor. So who is doing this? Um, what is a larger scale campaign? Underneath that, you have an incident. So this is Columbia Chemicals. This was a really early um, one day, everybody in an area that has chemical plants woke up to a message about a chemical leak. Uh, it wasn't real, it was a test. Um, so there's an exp explosion of the chemical plant. That was the narrative to the left. The incident itself, um, so you have a single incident here, and within that you have a lot of um, TTPs, tactics, techniques, procedures. So these are the activities that you see. So we know that they created a set of fake social media profiles. We know they created news hashtags. We know they use videos. We know that they baited. Um, so they, they sent early messages to Senator Jeff Merkley. Um, we know they used SMS. So those are the blue ones, the TTPs, but over to the right is a little green one called debunking. Uh, and that is a response. So we saw um, counters, countermeasures in there. And down at the bottom, artifacts, these are just a few of them. So uh, Amanda Gray was, Amanda Gray 91 was one of the fake accounts. Jeff Merkley was the influencer. Columbia Chemical was the, the hashtag. So it's just pick up using existing tool, uh, using existing framework. There's, there's another way of looking at this. Um, if you're doing disinformation, you'll hear about actor behavior content models, the ABC models. So this is how it looks. Um, so not quite as uh, comprehensive uh, as the Styx model, um, but you've got that threat actor at the top, you've got those behaviors, um, you've got the content at the bottom, which is all of those artifacts. The narrative is not part of ABC, but it's uh, pointing out that there are people who track purely at the narrative level. So these are the models that match. Uh, the other thing is the behavior in this doesn't include the blue team behaviors. So it doesn't include those responses. <coughs> One thing we've done is make the response and the instant behaviors on the same level. So we can start working those as um, games, as player games. So, okay, um, within that, uh, so this is the sticks um, work that we did. So, to, to the left, uh, all the things we had. So we basically added to what already existed, these two objects, incident and, attack and um, narrative, because there wasn't really a good equivalent in InfoSec. And the thing that we concentrated on was those attack patterns. So what are the techniques? And what we built was an equivalent to another um, MITRE tool, which is called attack. And this is a list of all of the techniques that we saw in 23 different um, incidents added over time, we've added more, but we're looking at these four phases. So from the left to the right, are the phases over time that um, instant creators generally go through. So they will plan it out. They'll then prepare um, accounts for people. They'll uh, prepare networks of networks of accounts of prepare those fake groups. Um, they'll develop out the content they're going to use. They'll decide which channels they're going to push it through, and then, only then, will they start executing. They 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 will pump primers where you put out messaging to smaller groups, smaller numbers. Um, exposure is where it gets out to a wider, much wider community. That's where it goes public. Uh, go physical, we added because we'd seen, um, especially the Russian internet research agency had tried putting two groups from opposing, um, well, opposing groups um, in the same place at the same time to see if they would fight. Um, so there was this idea that there were these physical things that you can spill over into. Uh, remote rallies and events blew up huge last year. Uh, merchandising. Um, all those QAnon t-shirts. Uh, and then we brought in from um, sales and marketing this idea of persistence of keep, even after your team has stopped concentrating on this incident, making sure it carries on in some way and measuring the effectiveness. If you're running 
a series of incidents is useful to measure the effectiveness of each one of those and feed that learning back into the next one. So one of the reasons for doing this, for mapping this, is that for every single one of these columns, which are the tactic phases, and every single one of those gray boxes, which are the techniques, there are ways to counter them, which is the next thing we did. So we went back and we got a load of post-its, a load of people, and we listed out these seven different types of response. So detection, because at the time everybody was working on just detecting campaigns, they weren't responding to them. So we said, get it out of your system, um, deny. So, so these come from um, JP313, which is um, a military manual on, on ways to handle um, information operations. So deny, stop them getting into your system. Um, you can interrupt them, disrupting them. You can slow down. Um, so one thing about this information is if you can slow down its propagation, it helps. So you degrade that. Uh, deception. You can honeypot them. Um, there'd be some nice honeypot moves. Or you can just um, destroy the source of the disinformation. So one of my favorite um, moves on this was the, the fire alarms. So, sorry, so the bomb threats. Um, so the Internet Research Service Research Agency at one point was receiving in perfect Russian, a bomb threat call every day, which disrupted their, their operation. They, they couldn't work while they were out of, outside the building. Um, so it just destroyed their ability to work. Other moves, um, things like you know, paying off people who are working on these, stop it at source. Uh, and deter, uh, this was added as this idea that you could discourage people from doing this in the first place. So we came up with 186 different counter maneuvers. And the way this is organized is basically we, we regrouped them to just see what we had there. Um, resourcing was interesting. Come on that in a minute. Um, if you're doing activities, uh, you have a set of resources. One of them is time. So one of the things you can do to, to stop a, a, an incident is to exhaust the resources they have available on, on either side. It, it's classic counter stuff. Um, so this is the countermeasures in the framework style again. Um, so the same as the attack framework. And you can kind of see lists of you know, if somebody has um, you know, develop people, you start building cultural resistance, you reallocate hijacked accounts. There, there, there are things you can do at each stage. This is brand new, by the way. So this is still in the wonky, still got to clean this up um, part. So you're the first people have seen this diagram. <laughs> so, and the other thing you can do is use those phases along the top to start talking about how you respond and specifically about how you can automate parts of those response. You, there have been lots of attempts to use machine learning to automate disinformation response. And it's, you don't get away from human in the loop. Um, you'll still need humans as part of response, but you can automate some. So this is the looking at those four tactic stages on both the attack and the defense sides. Uh, and this is work that Pablo Brewer has done on what is amenable to machine learning and what is still very much humans. For example, where it's red planning on the attack side, you're not going to automate that. But you might automate some of the execution moves on the defense side, the, the green. OK, um, just talking about multiple disciplines. I, I mentioned this earlier. That there's lots of us out there. So one axis. Um, if you're doing threat intelligence on, on this, you're going to need intelligence analysis. You need to understand uh, situation pictures. You need to understand intent. Attribution is really useful if you're working strategically uh, on large scale geopolitics. A lot of the time, it doesn't really matter who it was. You just want to stop the thing happening. OSINT, open source intelligence. Uh, there's a lot of that happening right now. So this is finding public data to make sense of the world. Um, a lot of that going on right now around the capital. 
um, data science, you need to be able to handle large amounts of data. You, you've got large amounts of data, you're looking at patterns, you're getting information in that. You have the 3B problem, the big data problem of it's big, it's fast, uh, and it's across lots of different types of, of system. So it's difficult to respond for humans to respond in time to the volume. You, the data science helps with that, helps reduce that. Um, another thing you can look at, this is from um, data science, so pulling each, from each of those disciplines, the data science ladder also applies. So we've moved from uh, people just doing descriptive, so looking at misinformation and not responding to it, trying to understand the whys, um, predicting ahead what might happen to now starting to, to respond. Um, so it's that what can we do about this? And the thing after that, you're starting to do self-learning, you're, you're starting to get into game theory, you're starting to get into, um, you make a response in the world, you change the world. It, it's, it, it's, it's activity, it, it's um, multiplayer games. And I've mentioned strategic operational tactical through this. Um, so some of this is at a strategic level, you're, you're spending the, you're doing these really beautiful reports about geopolitics. It takes weeks or months or years, but you're not responding. Um, at the tactical level, things are coming in. You're responding um, in minutes, hours, up to a couple of days, uh, longer if it's an instant, but you're focusing on, on those specific incidents. So this is up to last year was pretty much the data journalists, some of our teams, some of the crisis mappers but now pretty much everybody is down at a tactical level. And in the middle, there are people working on systems, um, working on that mid level. So quickly thinking back to a very old framework. So this is the OODA loop, um, not the OODA, but this is the John Boyd's original diagram. So just looking through at framework use in using um, UDA as part of this. And one of the things that's interesting in this, if you look at this original diagram, you already have uh, cultural traditions, experience, analysis, um, synthesis, heritage, sitting inside that orient part. So it, it, it's amenable. Oh, yeah, there are arguments. Um, the observed part, yeah, it, it was a long <laughs> deployment. Um, you start by looking at what you've got, you start by doing uh, triage, because there were so many things coming in, you have to work out which ones to concentrate on. So what's the harm, um, classic risk of you know, prob likelihood, harm, who's, who's the harm to? Um, is it actually part of our problem? Do, do we hand it over to somebody else? Uh, are we the right team? There are lots of teams who are responding, so you know, not falling over each other was a problem. And some of the things we were doing, um, activity analysis, so looking at those artifacts, tracking them, um, looking for those techniques, uh, so you could start responding to those techniques, looking for networks, so a lot of network analysis going on. Um, and you also get credibility verification, so the fact checking um, and also source checking. So not just the, the facts, but is this a credible source? Um, because you want to keep those ready for whilst you're doing those fast tactical responses. Um, things that came in useful. So graph analysis, uh, incredibly useful. So that's like a, a snurf ball of one of the incidents uh, who was involved in that. Um, text analysis, useful for finding those themes, useful for finding those narratives, classifying, clustering on them. Uh, and image analysis, really the, the most of the fake stuff we saw was shallow fakes, not deep fakes. Um, most of it was mislabeled or slowed down or just freaked a little. Um, most useful image stuff was clustering the images. You quite often you'd like the no one lockdowns, we got hundreds of images. And one of the things that we wanted to do carefully was to reduce the exposure of people to, to disinformation content. So if you can use text analysis, image analysis, um, audio if you've got audio, uh, to reduce the number of times they have to look at a piece of material, you, you do it. And situation pictures, so sense making out of that, um, 
generally you are sense making with groups of other people. So one of the things we used was the MIST platforms um, to put out coded. Um, so those sticks formatted, including the TTPs descriptions. So those went out. Um, we'd been working with uh, NATO, the EU, other organizations, TriLink, how to share rapidly. So working out what's going on from those that collected data and looking at the, the AMIC framework. So this is Plandemic um, as an AMIC, di AMIC diagram. So these are all of the techniques that we saw in the Plandemic. Plandemic was um, a health video um, that got virally spread. And these were all the pieces we found in it. So find the pieces, work out how you can respond to them. Um, other stuff that we found that we needed within that, uh, the MISP systems, uh, the stick system wasn't quite rich enough to describe all the pieces we had. So we built a whole bunch of new objects and added those into those, those systems. Uh, you've also got to think about things like the types of threat actors, so classifications. Uh, the DFR labs dichotomies of disinformation goes some way, but isn't enough. Um, it's very strategic. So we were working with NATO to build a tactical version. So the disinformation technology te taxonomy at NATO. Um, deciding, having collected, made sense of your world, then you decide what you can do within this. And one thing is thinking about who can do something within this. So for all of the counters that we have, we have lists of who's capable of acting within them. The things to the right is the ISALs. Um, so the ISACs. So these are response groups, federally mandated response groups. So 16 covering everything from healthcare to nuclear um, and transport and finance. And these are clearing houses for information. Um, so for information security attack information. So it's, they can act, but you have to get them information to be able to act. So this is about who can do something. So you've got what is happening, how could we respond, who could respond? Uh, and then that's that combination of that plus those uh, mitigations and countermeasures. So the, the seven Ds again, detect, destroy, deter, deny, deceive, disrupt, degrade. And having done that, decided what you're going to do then you then you start acting and then that gets you back into the OODA loop of you've changed the world you need to reobserve you need to reorient and this is this is really um one of the reasons for making the countermeasures and the instant ttps at the same level is you can then start showing these chaining effects uh, and start predicting ahead what the responses might be uh, as a chain over time, rather than just a static, I have seen this thing, I can put these things on it. Okay, I have used up my time, so I will stop there. And thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah. That was great. Thanks. Thanks for presenting. Um... Uh, yeah, so so I guess um, you know my what, one of the first questions I, I had is you know about this example that you talked about like we, uh, we won't stay home and, and about sort of distinguishing sort of disinformation versus kind of uh, a sort of debate around public dis you know about public policy and I guess that goes back to your, your sort of point about. Um, you know, sort of intent, and you know the the fact that maybe reasonable debates can be turned into sort of what into issues can be turned into disinformation campaigns by you know sort of uh, bad actors. Um, I, I I guess I'm just curious to what extent like the sort of bad actors that are at who are orchestrating campaigns like remain ambiguous or are hard to sort of, um, or, you know, like to what degree you can, um, 
I worry about the ones I can't see. Right. If they're really obvious, I mean, it's, it is just the same as information security. If it's really obvious, you go look for the thing behind it. Um, the recent stuff in the US, a lot's been domestic, but a lot of that was started uh, and inflamed from outside. So I was tracking back in 2016. <coughs> And, and at that point, the the easiest way to find disinformation was just to look for the QAnon hashtag. Literally everybody camped on QAnon. Um, but we watched um, narratives that were American grown, that were extremist narratives in America being picked up and amplified across to wider communities. Um, we watched divisions that were completely reasonable um, for example, the treatment of black people being picked up and again, artificially amplified into those communities to, to try to create responses. Um, part of the problem was that people just didn't expect it. Um, the black communities that I was connected to weren't fooled at all, um, which was wonderful. Other communities were very much fooled. Uh, Anti-vax is a classic one there. So you have this combination of grifters, um, so doing it for money, um, and external groups doing it for disruption. Uh, you know, it's it's a wonderful attack on a country. You reduce um, the country's resilience to disease. Uh, and this was you know, part of anti-vax. You were reducing the country's resilience and a large part of COVID, um, you know, the anti-masks, anti-response. It, it's, you've just created a massive problem in, in, a, in a place in a completely different area. A lot of it's subtle. Um, so some of it's, incredibly hard to work out what is, if you look at the content, what is genuine and what is disinformation? So some of those examples I showed you started as genuine, somebody puts this thing up and got co-opted as disinfo. Um, the easiest way, well, not necessarily easy, but um, the way that seems to work best is to concentrate on the context to look at the connections between things. Uh, you're looking for repeats, you're looking for behavior patterns, you're looking for patterns of connection and activity rather than the content. Con content tells you very little. So, I, I, but most people aren't trained to do that. They're being trained to look at content. Well, so, and so, so how do you, I mean, I guess you're looking at, you're talking about these other techniques of like mm -hmm. network analysis, other sort of like, yeah. you know, sort of uh, data science practices and trying to sort of under, use those to understand how narratives and ideas and arguments sort of move across, move between different communities. Yeah. Um, you know, and then there's this kind of ambiguous challenge of identifying the distinction or maybe maybe just maybe you can't disambiguate you can't sort of distinguish between like bad actors and and those who are just entertaining ideas that are being sort of uh you know being taken advantage of but the uh, i guess the other just this is a very sort of um the other question is like, you know, you describe the attackers in this diagram, you have your, your pyramid diagram and you have the attackers and then the the defenders, but who, um, so who in that scheme, who's going to pay for doing this defense? Like what's the motivation for it, right? Cause it comes at a cost clearly, like you guys are, you know, there's a teams of people working on this stuff. Like it takes time and energy. Right, I mean, nation states, I guess, are invested in it, but it seems like it's something that requires actually the kind of complex coalitions of people, organization, yes. uh, you know, like it's it's not just one group, it's like, a, as the, and that gets to this point of like a kind of distributed defense. 
Uh, we, we got uh, funding, a small amount of funding for our very first model that's otherwise been completely unfunded. So I myself have never been funded for this work. So it's part of it is waiting for it to hit, hit business so they, they actually wake up. The other thing is you talk about cost. You nearly lost your country over this. Sure. You know, that's one hell of a cost. And I think the federal funding is going to come behind that. So up to now, mostly it's been academic um, or it's been foundational or been people have been doing it as part of their, you know, journalism work or, but there've also been a lot of uh, volunteer groups involved. So people who have done it because it needed to be done. Uh, and, and that's, that's a great sadness. But that's also a structural part of having lived in the US for the last four years. Um, when it's coming from inside the house, it, it's hard to build responses to that. But there, there are, there, there's a, a DHS unit, so within CESA. So there are government units working on this. The military is waking up. It's taken a while, <coughs> but they can't respond most of the time anyway. Um, but well, yeah, I mean, it's- it, it seems like the response, I mean, to me, what you're, I guess what I'm curious, like where you see this going, this work, like oh, okay. who, who is, um, like, is the work that you're developing a model for, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, regulation of social media and like online communications, like, or, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just curious where you see things going. Okay, we've been building out the way to respond. Um, one of the reasons we targeted information security because it, they already did response as part of their job. So we figured it was easier to add another layer to people who already did this than it was to create completely new response organizations. So um, some of the ice house uh, are starting to build, in, build this in. We helped build the cognitive security ice house. So an ice house cuts across all of the ice acts. So it's a sharing and intelligence body that feeds into all the other bodies. Um, so that's building. Um, there are rumors of um, a capability being built similar to that for the US. There, there are capabilities back in the UK here. Um, we're looking at organizations. So something that should be released soon is, is work I've done with a company on how you build things that aren't the full ISO, that aren't the full um, SOC. So how do you put a, a disinformation desk into an existing SOC? It becomes it, an add-on. It, it looks like we might have a question for- Oh, yeah, um, all right. But yeah, but, but I'm, yeah. Um, so my question is that, you know, what if the disinformation is being carried out by, uh, you know, a group of people, you know, group that is aligned with the government, you know, in a country? And you cannot really rely on the you know governmental agencies, EU, NATO, and, you know agencies like that to to, to help you. Uh, so in that case, what can you really do? Like I, I do the entire process. I identify the campaign, mm -hmm. and is there a mechanism by which like is there some body that we can envision? You know, uh, it may not exist right now. That that you know that that can be there so that you know this um, we, we inform them and then they take it to the social media companies like what kind of response because can we really okay. do in that case okay so there are layers of this one of these things is part of this work on risk um disinformation risk is trying to build that into the social media platforms and the other organizations who have who carry any part of responsibility for disinformation or its defense. Um, the, what you do when the government is actively producing disinformation is what we've done for the last four years. Uh, you 
build teams, um, you build out things like reality team for those counter narratives, but you basically link together large numbers of um, volunteer teams. Mm -hmm. There are also, so uh, in a few hours time, when I, I, I officially get up, <laughs> I have a call with the United Nations who are building out units across the world. So there, it's starting to come together. Um, but really, it, it's last four years has been on the academics and in the, in, in the individuals who, who've been just kept keeping the government accountable. Um, the counter moves that we list, you know, things like you, know, you can report in, in into the platforms, you can report into the people with the money, they, they still work, um, regardless of where you are. So I, I mean, my answer is really you just keep going. It's hard work. It's, but it's necessary work. Good, good. Thank you. So, hey, good luck. So, I, I have I have one more question about regarding um, like the the different types of campaigns or different types of artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because you, you talked a lot about sort of like the big picture, sort of trying to best practices and frameworks around how to develop a sort of uh, uh, defense against these things. I guess the um, are most of the campaigns picking up off of things that are kind of already out there or do, to, do they, I guess my, the question is, is how do you, do you have like a taxonomy and a breakdown of the different types of um, campaigns that are being done, you know, and the artifacts that they produce? Um, we have our own sets of, of um, work. The, the person who's done a lot of this uh, is Joan Donovan over at Harvard. So she's been putting out lists. Oxford Internet Institute do a list per country every year. Um, other people who are mapping threat, threat actors include the European Union. They, they put out a uh, narrative level. And for very specific polit geopolitical actors, you've got uh, the Atlantic Council's DFR lab. So yes, there's work on collecting these up. Um, the thing about having a framework and collecting data against that framework is the more data you collect, the more signatures you collect. Um, right. People who create lots of instants become quite lazy. They tend to repeat themselves. So we're looking for those tales. Again, it's very much like information security. You, you have advanced persistent threats. You have groups that are known. Oh, yes, FireEye also keeps lists. So it's worth looking at Lee Foster's team there. Hmm. Um, uh, are there any other questions? Have, I, I, I see you've been kind of fielding com questions and comments yes. in, the, in the chat as well, you know, so there, maybe I missed some. Um, Oh, yeah, I mean, one thing in there was um, someone said that the repo changed. Yes, yeah, we, we combined the, we had the counters repo and the instant repo separately. We've combined it all into one big framework repo. Uh, and we have a set of user guides that we've, they're out for comment at the moment. It should make life a little easier. Well, thank you so much for presenting. This was very interesting. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to reading more about your projects from the, the websites that you have. Oh. Yeah, well, it was lovely to meet you. I'm just sad it wasn't in real. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we're, I think we're all trying to figure out how to adapt to this new arrangement, you know, doing, doing things yeah. over Zoom online. Yeah. So. Well, I should be back in Bellingham in March. So if anyone wants to hang out in a very distant, socially distant way. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. All right. Well, safe, uh, well, safe travels and good luck with whatever you're doing in England now. So thank you.